Thank you for joining us today for a discussion of a newly released report, Creativity Amid Crisis, Legal Pathways for Venezuelan Migrants in Latin America. It is a joint production of the Migration Policy Institute with the OAS. Um, it is here. I think you have copies on your seats, um, and there are more copies if you need them. Um, we were inspired to do this um, looking at what is going on in Latin America. I think well, everyone here knows that there have been um, probably far more than 3 million Venezuelans who have left their country most in the last 2 or 3 years. Most have gone to other countries in Latin America, almost 80%, probably more than that, with particularly large concentrations in countries like Colombia and Peru and Ecuador and Chile, uh, Argentina, Panama, Brazil, and even Mexico, Trinidad and Tobago and other places. Um, this has generated, Latin America has traditionally been a region of the world where that people were leaving, right? This is, these have been immigrant countries that were looking at how to deal with relationships with the diaspora. More recently, of those immigrant fl immigration flows slowed. We're dealing with the return of people to their home countries in many cases. But this is the first time we've seen on such a large scale and throughout the entire hemisphere a large flow of people into countries of Latin America, to almost every country in Latin America, um, in which countries have really begun to have to look at immigration policy, look at asylum policy, look at what to do. And the Venezuelan crisis um, has really been a test for countries to develop, innovate, um, and think about immigration policy. Um, we looked at a number of countries in, the, in this report. This report is co-authored by Jessica Bolter, Betty Munoz Pogosian, and Miriam Hassan. You'll hear from all of them. And we have two other great panelists here who I'll introduce as they speak. Um, the, uh, our hope was really to look at what countries are doing. Overall, there has been an enormous solidarity with Venezuelans who have come to most of the countries in Latin America. Part of this is out of a sense of, of good neighborliness. But part of this has been, and we just were on a phone call, we did a Spanish language launch of this on a, on a webcast before doing this one, and we had the, the director of, of Colombia's migration agency with us. What he said is, you know, this is also a recognition that it's much better off, we're much better off having people who are legally in the country than people who are here in a regular status. This has really been the calculation of most of the countries in the region is, you know, people are going to arrive anyway. This is a massive outflow from a country that is in collapsing economically, that is in political strife. Um, we're not going to touch on the political situation specifically today, but I think all of you know, you know, it has intensified in the past few days. But this is a country of enormous political strife, as well as an economic meltdown where inflation has reached over a million percent, depending whose numbers you follow. Um, really unimaginable. And so you're not going to be able to stop the flow of people. We're much better off actually having people in a regular status than a regular status. And that has been the main calculation of a number of these countries. That's good in terms of the labor market, that's good in terms of people's access to education, to basic services like healthcare, overall these are going to produce better outcomes. And of course it's been helped by the fact that on average the Venezuelan migrants who are arriving are quite well educated. Right? I mean, overall, tend to have a little bit more education and training than the average population in the countries where those are arriving. So there's also a sense of being able to take advantage of some of the human capital that's arriving in these countries. These are not, um, the policies have, have sometimes been created on the fly. Um, I, as I think colleagues in, in Colombia and Peru and the government would say, you know, they were faced with a large number of people arriving. They were trying to figure out how to do this quickly. And so they invented temporary protection programs to allow people to stay that have, were not on the books before. So a number of countries have done this. Other countries have used agreements like Argentina uh, uh, was able to use uh, existing Mercosur agreement. Now I'm getting into Jessica's talk here. Um, but a number of countries have used things that were on the book, but a lot of them have actually innovated in new ways. And so part of what was fascinating looking at this and part of what we think is important, there really has been a construction of immigration policy in the countries of the region. Some of it very permanent, some of it is really rethinking immigration laws for the future, and some of it is responding to an immediate crisis but is now leading to permanent solutions and to thinking about permanent solutions about both immigration policy and integration policy. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over to my colleague Jessica Bolter, who has done a great deal of work on this report, who's going to tell you some of the principal findings. So Jessica, program um, policy analyst here at the, uh, or research assistant? Research assistant, okay. Um, here at Migration Policy Institute and a fabulous colleague who is an expert on many things, including now this. So. Thank you, Andrew. 
So I will give a brief overview of the range of regional responses that we found in three areas during this report uh, in terms of entry documents, in terms of regularization, and in terms of asylum systems. So the first barrier to Venezuelan migration arises around what entry documents uh, the different countries require. Over the past couple decades, as the region has started to receive more interregional mi migrant flows, Latin America has moved toward a more liberal visa regime, rarely requiring visas from nationals of other countries in the region. Now, this was when the flows were starting, but they were still pretty small. Venezuelan migration is challenging this model due to the high volume of migrants that the countries have received in such a short period of time. Panama was the first and so far the only country to start requiring visas of Venezuelans to enter, uh, which was in 2017. But some other countries have added additional requirements. Ecuador and Peru, for example, both implemented a passport requirement in August of 2018. Ecuador's requirement, of course, was blocked in court, although now it has just recently started requiring Venezuelans to present their uh, certification of clean criminal records before entering. Uh, and in Peru, after a court initially blocked it, the passport requirement was implemented, although the authorities have allowed kind of an informal workaround where those without passports at the border can simply submit an asylum application uh, and enter the country with the temporary work permit that they've been provided with their asylum application. So while this is a better strategy maybe than relegating these migrants to illegal pathways, it has also massively overwhelmed Peru's asylum system. What we see as the greatest potential problem and also the place where countries have been able to be really creative uh, is um, preventing Venezuelans from falling into irregular status, uh, helping Venezuelans to regularize. To their credit, most of the top receiving countries have recognized, as Andrew pointed out, um, that regularization is necessarily the first step to allow Venezuelans to integrate into and contribute to uh, these host countries, and also to allow the host governments to benefit from them, to know who's in their territory. So some countries have used existing pathways. Uh, Argentina has allowed Venezuelans to apply for Mercosur visas, even though Venezuela has been suspended from Mercosur since 2016. Um, similarly, Ecuador has created an UNASUR visa that, uh, back in 2017 that Venezuelans have relied on. Uh, in Mexico, Venezuelans were issued the most temporary and permanent residence visas of any nationality in the first nine months of 2018. Um, that's the latest data available. Uh, but keeping in mind that Mexico has received a relatively smaller number of Venezuelan migrants than some of the other countries. Now, other countries like Colombia, Peru, Brazil, uh, they have created completely new legal permits in their attempts to regularize Venezuelans, demonstrating an impressive degree of creativity and flexibility. Colombia's special stay permit, for example, has given more than 580,000 Venezuelans work authorization and the ability to remain in Colombia for two years. However, it's unclear what the pathway is to permanent residence in Colombia after these two years are up, and that will start to happen this August for some Venezuelan migrants. Peru's temporary stay permit has given similar protections to 175,000 Venezuelans for one year with 320,000 more applications in process by the end of 2018. This permit, unlike Colombia's, uh, does have a clear path to legal status as it allows Venezuelans to apply for residency when their permit is up. These permits are impressive short-term responses to a rapid migrant flow, and they demonstrate how some countries, like Andrew mentioned again, are having the chance to create immigration policy from the ground up. But they're also ad hoc responses, and they're available only to certain migrant populations. So in Colombia, it's those who entered before December 17th, 2018. In Peru, it's those who entered before October 31st. These limitations are understandable in that countries may not want to set up a permit that might attract uh, future migrants, but they also leave later arrivals with fewer status options. 
Now, some countries have been less flexible toward Venezuelan migrants. Um, in April 2018, Chile made several changes to its migration policies. While it did create a special visa for Venezuelans, uh, this visa presents several barriers, one of which is that it can only be obtained from within Venezuela. And further, most migrants who enter without these visas as tourists now no longer have a pathway to permanent residency. Essentially, Chile, unlike the attempts some other countries are making, is not facilitating regularization as effectively as possible. Now, the other pathway, the final one that I'm going to talk about to regularization, besides a visa or legal permit, is asylum or refugee status. This is a less viable pathway um, <clears throat> in most countries, as most of them had received fewer requests for humanitarian protection in the past, with the exception of Ecuador. Um, so most of these countries have uh, less developed asylum systems. Latin America also has one of the broadest definitions of asylum in the world. Um, the 1984 Regional Cartagena Declaration defined it as applying not just to those fleeing persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group, but also those fleeing generalized violence and disturbances to the public order. Under this definition, some have argued that all Venezuelans should be eligible for asylum, but so far only Mexico has taken this definition into consideration in its asylum adjudications. Um, so now I will turn to Miriam Hassan. She will speak further about some of the challenges and opportunities that countries in the region are facing. To the podium, as you can go up to the podium, let me introduce you. Uh, Miriam Hazan is a migration specialist at the Organization of American States. Uh, Dr. Hassan was previously a senior consultant with the American Development Bank, where she led a major research project on international migration dynamics in Central America, Mexico, Haiti, and Dominican Republic, a phenomenal report that we'll have to talk about another event here. She's also a senior fellow with the Tower Center for Political Studies at SMU, and she's held research and scholarly positions at Demos, Ideas in Action, the University of Pennsylvania, Rutgers University, the Tomas Rivera Policy Institute, UT Austin, and most importantly, at MPI. So... Um, she has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. It's great to have you here, Miriam. And she's a co-author on the report. And oh, I'm here. Well, no, no, no. We started there. <laughs> Migration specialist at the organization American States, working with Betilde. And anyone who wants to tweet about this, and we hope you will tweet. This is a public meeting. Um, you can tweet questions to at Migration Policy. Um, you can also use the hashtag MPI Discuss. And you can, if you have questions for us, you can email events at migrationpolicy.org. Miriam, adelante. So thank you very much, Andrew, for introducing me, and thank you very much for having me. It's, it's nice to be here back. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm, I'm going to speak about the challenges. Uh, Jessica has already uh, explained some things. I think I will cover a little bit because just to present it as a challenge. Um, one of the main challenges that I think uh, right now uh, uh, happens with Venezuelan migration and refugee movements is the, the problem of irregularity. Uh, over, it's around 60% of all the Venezuelans are irregular right now. Even with all the initiatives that the countries have taken, irregularity is still a very big problem. Even if uh, Colombia were to regularize the population uh, that it has, which is the country, that the main recipient country, the, one, the estimated 1.1 million uh, Venezuelans that are right now in Colombia, which Colombia sometimes count them, counts them with the Colombo Venezuelans that also come, but really this is, these are the Venezuelans alone. Uh, still, we will have 40% uh, of irregular people in, in the region. So with all the creativity, we still don't know what will happen, really. What would be a, the, the main solution for that? It really requires to, to be more creative and pro possibly to come with more common frameworks and protocols. To, to deal with that. The other thing is how to deal with the claims of humanitarian protection in overburden asylum systems. As uh, Jessica described, the region does have one of the, apart from Africa, really one of the most progressive, complete definitions uh, for refugees. Uh, it, it has con some countries have considered, considered them within their law, uh, which Latin America has a complex uh, refugee and asylum law, different from the U.S. is one of the things that we've been discovering in the region. Uh, so part of it is more traditional uh, definition of the 1951 protocol. Another part is the Cartagena Declaration. Um, so uh, the countries have chosen not to follow that path. It's not really integrated. There are no really frameworks to, to make it possible right now, except for the case of Mexico, but as uh, Jessica said, 
uh, Mexico, really the flows to Mexico are very small and the beneficiaries uh, in Mexico having 4,000 people, over 50, uh, 60% have been approved in that framework, which is really good, but still it's very low to think that that's a solution. And we should think about the, this issue because considering what is going on right now in the country, uh, which we could face scenarios of potential you know, repression, con considering that uh, si the situation has become more complex in, in Venezuela. We could see more people with the need of uh, a, a legal protection uh, as refugees. Uh, so far, most migrants have been char characterized by the o OEM DTM framework as economic migrants. Uh, but we, we might see more people that really qualify as refugees and we'll see how the system will work. One interesting case is the case of Peru because Peru is the largest recipient of asylum seekers, yet it really is very much uh, a situation where it happened because of a decision that for the uh, uh, temporary permit they had to show the passport, so really they moved to apply for asylum uh, status, but really uh, Peru is not processing this, 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 is not assigning anybody for, for that status. So it's really more the, the country grants them through that system a permit to work, so it's a solution, but it's really temporary. So then the question is uh, how to shift from temporary to permanent measures. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the main questions. So far, the countries have been very creative. But uh, possibly in some ways they will have to move out of the paradigm that they have pursued so far because at the end of the road they'll face the problem of what to do with a population that may stay for a while. Uh, it is hard to foresee uh, an immediate return of the Venezuelan population. Uh, if we know anything about migration, we know that uh, even if there is a stable, uh, well-done transition to democracy, the economy will take a while to recover. And so it will be hard to see that uh, people will return and people have already established networks. So these countries have to think in the long term, how will they uh, deal with this population? And so even Colombia that has expanded its temporary permit has not yet come up with more permanent solutions. Uh, it is true that countries like Argentina, for example, uh, allows through uh, Mercosur uh, the possibility of acquiring the residency. So Argentina in this case is, is one of the most proactive countries. It has even moved to be more flexible because that was a challenge in Argentina that uh, it required documents that people didn't have because this is the other challenge. I mean that uh, uh, Venezuelans uh, are required to provide certain documents uh, that they can't provide, uh, that they don't have access to. So this leads us to another challenge, which is the, the, the challenge of integration. And so we have the question, uh, cases like Ecuador that now require for entrance and also to be in the country uh, to have a criminal background check coming from Venezuela. So this all points to the, the need for the countries to find uh, more long-term solutions that are viable in, in practice, because otherwise this will move people to more levels of irregularity. Uh, in that the, uh, same sense, we should think in the case of Ecuador, there was recently a, a, an incident, and this is one of the dangers in the region, that if we face incidents like the one that occurred in Ecuador, specifically uh, a woman was uh, assassinated by her uh, boyfriend. Uh, he, he was characterized as Venezuelan, turns out that he was Colombo-Venezuelan, but still came from Venezuela, and so that created a People went after the Venezuelan population in the town where that happened, in the town of Ibarra, and in the whole country they, they started to, to, uh, to, to go after the Venezuelans to the point that uh, we saw also some uh, small incidents of Venezuelans trying to return to Venezuela because they were afraid. And so it is interesting that the position of the ombudsman of the country said that uh, really uh, the solution for situations like this is to think uh, more proactively about integration so that we can prevent incidents like that. So that's one of the challenges. And just to not take much more time, uh, I want to go just to the opportunities. Uh, despite these challenges, uh, this, this crisis uh, represents a redistribution of resources in the region and of, also of political power in many ways. Uh, countries will receive a lot of resources that they weren't expecting. And it's really an opportunity, first of all, to, mo to modernize their legal frameworks. Uh, in terms uh, specifically on immigration, 
uh, uh, the, the, the agencies, the procedures, it's really uh, it's testing their system and it allows them to think what are the solutions for the future and in that, in that uh, context Latin America can well play a very interesting role uh, in the new context of the global compact of thinking about solutions for the 21st century. But also, it represents a solution to modernize systems in relation to uh, uh, access to, to documents for the local population and also for the provision of services because the resources that will arrive are also for integration. So it may help modernize the labor market systems, the social protection systems. Uh, one of the major issues in, 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 the, in the region is the high levels of informality, and this will be a test and a challenge in, in Peru. 70% of the population is in the informal economy, 67% in Ecuador, 57% in Colombia. So this is going to be a challenge to have this new arriving population, uh, creating a lot of pressure in the, in the economy. So in that sense, it is an opportunity for these countries to, to take this Venezuelan migration as a step to also uh, create more inclusive policies for their populations. And, um, uh, the, the other great opportunity is, uh, which I will leave the space for, for Betilde, is, is the fact that it opens up the spaces for political dialogue in the region that we haven't had in a while, and, and maybe to arrive to consensus. Thank you, Miriam. Well, that's great. That was a great opening. Now you have a sense of where the report is. We want to now discuss some of the issues on the table. We have a panel de lujo. We have a fabulous panel here to talk about the, the issues here. Um, the Betilde Munoz Bogosian, Dr. Betilde Munoz Bogosian, is the uh, co author, first of all, one of the co authors of the report, but also the director of the Department of Social Inclusion at the OAS. For more than 15 years, she's led missions, programs, and projects and conducted research on issues of democracy, elections, equity, and social inclusion, among other things. She's a PhD in political science from Florida International University. It's been great working together. Um, uh, Francisco Quintana is the program director for Andean. I'm going to mess up your title here, Francisco, as you know. For Andean, North America and Caribbean region of the Center for Justice and International Law, Sahil, which many of you know. Um, he has previously, he was a staff attorney at Sahila's office in Costa Rica, and he was also a senior staff attorney at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And he's also been leading a, or co-leading, a uh, region-wide coalition of organizations, civil society organizations, looking at Venezuelan migration and refugees as well, and so has a really ground-level look of this as well. Um, and Diego Chavez is, uh, I, I'm now proud to, to to say, and that's I think an official announcement, is a visiting fellow at the Migration Policy Institute as of today, um, and also a consultant with the World Bank working in Washington, D.C. Um, previous to up until December, he was with the IOM in Colombia, held several senior positions, including leading the displacement tracking matrix, and he was seconded to the presidency, the president's office uh, in Colombia when they were putting in place the temporary uh, program called the PEP, actually, and so was part of putting that together and has a lot of very much on the ground knowledge as well as a lot of comparative knowledge with uh, some of the other countries. Um, to start off where Miriam ended, I mean, this is a period of enormous creativity. Um, if we're lucky, it's a period of enormous creativity both for immigrants and immigration policy, but also for the countries in Latin America more broadly. I mean, one, one of the things that, that struck me from an earlier conversation we had on this issue with the head of, of Peru's migration service. As she very clearly says, you know, one of the things that happened because we were trying to regularize 400,000 people is it turns out that we ended up digitalizing things, digitizing things. This is something we should have done anyway, right? This is, but it wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the fact that we suddenly were dealing with more people than we could deal with, right? And we couldn't stand having lines outside the door that stopped making sense. That is a bit of a metaphor for what you were talking about, right? I mean, this is the moment to think about also integration. How do you deal with education for migrants? How do you deal with, with healthcare for migrants? But that's also a question about receiving communities, a question of broader questions of education and healthcare in Latin America. And so one of the hopes is this moves from being a moment of creativity around immigrants themselves to a moment of creativity around provision of services and issues that, that communities are facing more broadly, both as they receive migrants, but also in their daily life. Um, this is something, the response in Latin America has been driven by a mixture of solidarity, a mixture of foreign policy. A lot of the countries that have been very involved in receiving migrants also have strong opinions about what should happen in Venezuela and, and receiving migrants is an extension of their foreign policy. But it is, as, as we said earlier, also a pragmatic calculation that is better to know who's in your country than not. 
It's better to have people in the labor market who have legal status than people who don't have legal status. It's better for kids to go to school than not be able to access education. Um, but there are some signs, as Jessica noted, that things could be moving backwards in some countries. And no country is able to receive an unlimited number of new newcomers in a short period of time, right? I mean, this has been a large wave. It hasn't, it hasn't. I mean, let's put it in a bit of context. It's been a large wave in, in terms of the speed and the numbers. And certainly in Colombia and Peru, the numbers are pretty big. If you look at percentage of the population that's foreign born, however, in most of these countries, it's still fairly low actually, compared to many other countries in the world. So yes, it's a huge change, but you know we're not yet talking about the, the kind of numbers that you see in some other countries that have out, dealt with large incoming populations in a short period of time. So there, there's nothing that says these countries are not able to take more, but certainly the speed and the scale is something that we should be concerned about. And it is something we're starting to see reactions on. Ecuador being the most recent, I mean, that was this week, actually, when they began to impose restrictions at the border. And Ecuador, ironically, has been the country that was really leading the openness in Latin America to continue to receive people with all sorts of entry documents. And now has one of the most restrictive regimes as of a couple days ago. So with all this on the table, lots of movement. Um, Betilde, we're going to start with you. Tell us a little bit. Uh, about from your perspective at the OAS, how are you seeing this? What are the huge challenges for the countries in Latin America as they deal with, with Venezuelan migration and refugees? Thank you, Andrew, and of course to Jessica and Miriam for the uh, analysis that uh, they share with us based on the report that we put together. And of course, I must thank you publicly, Andrew, and the Migration Policy Institute for seen in the Organization of American State as a partner, strategic partner, to get this discussion going, uh, both from the technical as well as the political standpoint. Uh, and again, in one of the, the, the challenges, the key challenges that the region is facing, and you guys at the end of the year closed with the you know, top challenges for the world, and that includes the migration and refugee crisis uh, happening in South America uh, from Venezuela. So I just wanted to focus on, uh, from a more regional perspective and the standpoint of the OIS, on four key issues that were already touched on by uh, Miriam and Jessica that are reflected in the report, but perhaps could serve as a, a framework for the discussion that's going to happen uh, right after we speak. Um, uh, firstly, the need to provide viable solutions for legal permanence and to prevent irregularity, which was pointed out as one of the key challenges by Miriam. Uh, secondly, they need to work as fast as possible in the socioeconomic integration of these populations and thinking uh, now more medium to long term rather than uh, on the short term ad hoc responses. Thirdly, they need to support local governments that can play a key role in, in addressing these flows. And finally, the whole discussion on funding and how to ensure that we can uh, help defray the cost of this solidarity that the countries have, uh, have shown, rallying international uh, support as well as maybe the diaspora that can play a key role on this. On the need to address uh, um, or to think of these viable solutions for a more uh, permanent legal uh, residence, the policy brief documents um, the difficulties Venezuelans are facing in terms of accessing doc documentation to enter the countries of destination, such as passports and other forms of ID, uh, as well as some of the measures taken by certain countries and later reverted or modified to ensure that, spe that a specific documentation is provided at entry and to be allowed to stay. Uh, while this is a valid measure that states exercising their full sovereignty uh, can adopt, the current situation that Venezuela is facing politically speaking, that we all know that is getting uh, more intense lately, as well as the conditions for accessing or obtaining the right documentation warrants the adoption of flexible and practical solutions um, that could be best reached through multilateral cooperation rather than acting in a unilateral way. A possibility includes the adoption of common protocols among receiving countries, uh, again, requiring the, the presentation of documents that are hard to come by for Venezuelans it tends to incentivize irregularity. And uh, this is a problem because migration is likely to continue uh, for a while as you know, presented by Miriam as one of the points in terms of the continuation of the flows. Uh, the recent measure adopted by Ecuador on requiring criminal background checks with the apostille is a case in point. While this country can legitimately adopt any measure it deems necessary to protect national security, an open question is, will it really protect uh, this national security by adopting the measure? 
what are Venezuelans to do if I, they cannot access uh, the, these criminal records uh, check? Um, are they going to forge them? Uh, I mean, there's a series of questions uh, in that, that we need that need to be asked, and uh, do we know if these documents really tell us something about the criminal background of the person? So there's a, a need for a discussion, and again, in a multilateral, uh, regional uh, uh, environment, uh, about what other measures could be discussed, could be adopted, such as the taking of fingerprints, relying on Interpol, Interpol records, and a series of other uh, points that could be uh, addressed. So what do we propose, uh, you know, from the standpoint of a regional multilateral organization, uh, again, the adoption of these common protocols, and perhaps building in uh, these that political dialogue processes spearheaded by Ecuador with the Quito meeting that happened in September, the one that happened in November, and, you know, putting the whole convening power of the OAS to promote these discussions at the political level with the migration authorities as well as any other relevant uh, authorities to agree on a, a, uh, on a clear framework uh, uh, for, um, uh, for these exigencies uh, uh, to the Venezuelans. And of course, even utilize some of the forums that the Organization of American States has as uh, available, such as the Commission on Migration Affairs and the meetings of high-level authorities on migration and related uh, 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 fora, that could also uh, be a, an instrument to arrive at this consensus. The second point on the need to work as fast as possible on the integration of these populations. Um, we want to think that displaced Venezuelans can be can provide a positive contribution to the countries that are receiving them. And this is so, it was mentioned earlier, I believe it was you, Andrew, who said it at the beginning, that the uh, Venezuelans, uh, migrants and refugees are arriving with uh, uh, the advanced degrees in some cases, but with certain education, skills, capabilities. Some are coming with certain uh, um, job experience or, or you know, in, a, in a particular professions. We have a report from the IOM, and perhaps uh, Diego can go a little bit deeper on this, that uh, indicates that at least 60% of Venezuelan migrants have university degrees. So uh, in the short term, of course, uh, receiving countries must work toward facilitating uh, the recognition of academic degrees and hopefully agree on certain protocol at the regional level. But they also must consider the granting of work permits at the moment that the regularization process starts as well as they need to start thinking on uh, political, uh, I'm sorry, uh, economic and social insertion programs that build on this uh, human capital, but also promoting entrepreneurship and a series of other things. And, and that will contribute because, you know, working on this and ensuring that their labor inclusion will guarantee or at least contribute to their economic independence will prevent them from becoming a burden on the receiving country and countries and will reduce labor informality, which again was also mentioned earlier, is one of the key issues to, that need to be addressed. And in this particular uh, regard, I want to um, share with you that from the standpoint of the OAS, along with IOM, ILO, as well as FAO, we are working on a regional program that will specifically address uh, the socio-economic socio integration of uh, Venezuelans, but also thinking of how this could also benefit the, le the local community. So, because this tends to also uh, generate episodes of xenophobia, so we want to work on, uh, on the two levels. On the need to support local governments, and this is especially thinking long term, uh, we need to give attention to the role local, uh, local governments, municipalities, cities play in addressing these flows, uh, because cities absorb, in the end, the day-to-day -day burdens uh, of uh, receiving these migrants in their transition to the country, to the city, uh, they are responsible for providing the services that they need every day. Um, we know, for instance, that a high number uh, of migrants tend to live together and share living spaces to maximize their rent and even send part of their earnings back home through remittances. While this is understandable, it also gener generates risks and there's, you know, policies that cities can take in terms of, uh, uh, you know, applying rules that, that set the number of tenants in, or in control as well as uh, providing access to dignified uh, housing. There's also discussions uh, or, or potential uh, contributions of the cities and municipalities on um, programs of social cohesion between the, the, the community that is receiving Venezuelans as well as the new arrivals. And this you know, goes different ranges, including the use of sports and all, all their cultural activities to generate integration. 
And again, uh, precisely to, uh, with the purpose of sharing innovation, sharing lessons learned, as well, as well as good practices, and also collectively think of what other policies could be addressed, the OSC is trying, uh, also promoting the possibility of holding a regional forum of local and municipal authorities uh, uh, to generate this space regional. Of course, this is political and policy dialogue that can help uh, at least map out what are the good practices in terms of uh, integration at the level of the cities. And finally, on the need to ensure access to funding to defray the, the costs of solidarity, we know that there's institutions such as the IOM, the UNHCR, civil society organizations that we hope to hear from Paco uh, about uh, what's being done in the field uh, to address the flows. However, this, all of this has a cost, and it's also putting a lot of pressures on the receiving countries uh, in terms of the, the, the uh, you know, all the monies that they need to put available to be able to uh, uh, provide a short-term humanitarian response, <laughs> vaccines as basic as vaccines, as well as access uh, to health services. It's, and, and the thing is that it's, it's becoming clear that there is an urgent need, need to identify the funding, while at the same time the funding is not coming so fast, right? So, you know, this discrepancy uh, is something that we need to address, and I believe this is something that we haven't paid more uh, a lot of attention because we've been focused on the more short-term responses. So there's an important discussion that needs to happen, and, and hopefully the OIS can also play a role in terms of how to convene a donors' conference, uh, articulating what are the needs, articulate and defining what are the gaps in terms of the needs and what's really being provided, so that uh, we can rally the international community support, financial support, as well as the diaspora uh, or members of the diaspora, private sector that can actually uh, provide uh, some support in terms of addressing the cost. And in closing, very briefly, two points that I, that I wanted to stress. Number one, and this is something that is a responsibility that we all have. We all have good intentions. We all want to uh, support uh, uh, both migrants and refugees and the countries receiving them, as well as Venezuela, of course, uh, uh, in addressing the crisis. But uh, these, the good efforts and the good intentions tend to be a little bit dispersed. So there's a need to start uh, more deliberately articulating uh, these good intentions and, and, and organizing how we're going to provide uh, the, the future responses and hopefully the more longer term responses. And then the second, it was brought up, uh, brought up by Miriam and I believe by Jessica too, which is this discussion on um, using the Cartagena Declaration uh, as a potential framework from, you know, to use to protect, to provide legal protection to Venezuelans. And here, you know, it's an important discussion that I think needs to happen at the regional level and, again, the OES in terms of uh, a, a forum, a natural forum for political dialogue can play a role uh, assessing whether the, it, what's more convenient in terms of providing the quick response that these Venezuelans need and ensuring that they can be easily and, and as fast as possible integrated into the labor market. Uh, 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 utilizing the framework can be useful in terms of uh, rallying more financial support, but at the same time, there's very quick, pragmatic, and creative responses that are happening uh, on the part of the receiving country. So, you know, this tension is something that is not really resolved. I don't have the answer, but it's something that I believe we should continue focus on. Great, thank you. Okay. It's great for delay. I know Francisco's going to want to jump in on that last point there. But before we do that, let me go to Diego on uh, uh, to talk. You were there really at the birth of the PEP, which is the largest of these temporary measures, 580,000, 82,000 people that have applied for this. This is a large regularization program. I and mean, this is a massive undertaking in a country that really did not have an experience with a lot of immigration policy. I mean, in fact, I, I, I think immigration authorities in Colombia would say honestly that part of the reason that the immigration ministry is in the foreign ministry is that it was at the time thought of as primarily about multinational companies and tourism, right? I mean, people in Colombia were not thinking about massive immigration to the country, and yet Colombia has actually very quickly turned around, in addition to dealing with internally displaced people, turned around to try and deal with this imperfectly. Um, so maybe you can give us a sense of sort of what's worked, but also what are some of the shortcomings and what needs to be addressed in the future. Yeah, we'll right. Francisco, to talk a little bit about the comprehensive regional. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrew. It's it's a pleasure to be sharing this yeah. uh, panel with uh, and Jessica welcome to NPI, by the way. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Matilde and Francisco, of course. Yeah, I was um, I was part of more of the PEV that seek to regularize irregular migrants within the country, but this is not the 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 first effort that it was made by by Colombia. 
in terms of uh, securing PEPs for uh, special permits uh, for, for Venezuelan migrants. And just before I talk a little bit about the, the, the PEP experience, I want to I wanna just mention that um, in Colombia, we, we tend to talk about three profiles in terms of migration from Venezuela and three types of migration as well. So we talk about uh, returning Colombians, we talk about mixed families, and we talk about Venezuelans. This is the profiles of migration. Uh, and within the types of migration, we talk about migrations, uh, people that want to stay in the country, which is roughly around 80% of, of the people that we have been able to survey uh, through different survey mechanisms, not just uh, the displacement tracking matrix, for instance, with IOM or the profiling exercises with uh, UNHCR or even the same registration process that we actually had with the government at a certain point. Uh, we also have a, a great amount of people that are actually transiting through the country. Um, uh, some of them are actually walking. They, they go to Cucuta, which is in the eastern part of, uh, of, the, of our border. We have a border, by the way, uh, we share a border with Venezuela of, this is 2,200 kilometers, which is 1,300 some, something miles. Uh, and we only have seven official crossing points. So basically, it's a distance from Athens to Berlin and only seven official crossing points. So a lot of people usually tend to cross the border irregularly. Um, um, by dirt roads called uh, trochas, for instance, in the Guajira, or by, uh, by boat in, in Arauca, and sometimes even helped to, uh, with, within the crossing part uh, with, uh, with the help of, uh, of uh, rebels, guerrilla rebels, or other organized crime within that region. So um, it is important to mention that mo most of the people, or some of the people that are actually in transit, they're actually walking from Cucuta to Rumichaca, which is in the southern part of the of, of our border, it's roughly uh, also like fifteen hundred kilometers. I don't know in miles how much that is, like a thousand, really <laughs> like a thousand miles, and they're walking. I, I was speaking to a priest actually once, and he told me that it was a, a biblical thing, like an exodus, mm -hmm. basically what he was actually seeing on the, on, on the roads. And actually, the government right now it's it's helping them have some sort of like humanitarian transit. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then certainly we have back and forth migrants, migrants that are coming into the country, they are granted a, this special card permit, uh, which allows them to buy medicine, have a, have a job, uh, or sell some, formally or informally, uh, go to emergency rooms uh, in hospitals, and then just go back to, to Venezuela. Uh, certainly I'm not talking here about uh, indigenous groups in Colombia and in Venezuela, indigenous groups are actually able to move freely through both of, of the territories. So also there is also that type of migration, which hasn't been really studied, uh, nor by the government, nor by uh, cooperating agencies. Uh, certainly we do have some variables and we can talk a little bit about that, but no, no in-depth studies have, have been done in terms of that. So we have been able to register roughly around 100,000 Colombians, returning Colombians, and we have on list uh, roughly around 300,000 Colombians. So that would be like 400,000 people that are actually coming from Venezuela. Uh, 2015 was a very turning point for, 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 for the Colombian movement of people, just like you mentioned, Andrew. Um, because President Maduro at that time, he started like crossing the doors with, with chalk of, of, of where the Colombians actually lived, and they had to, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, 90,000 Colombians uh, had to leave uh, the country of Venezuela and go back to Colombia. They were expelled out of the country. And this is some sort of like a turning point in terms of the dynamics. And I think it's important to mention uh, those uh, families as well. We also have mixed families, people that left in, in the 80s, but they married a Venezuelan uh, person and they had kids and we have like this mixture of families these people are some of them are actually able to be uh, uh, to, to register as Colombians and then receive all the goods and services but this takes a little bit of a while uh, the process is a bit too slow yet at the moment and uh, this is not being done by Migración Colombia which is the, the the migration authority within the country but it's actually done by another uh, institution that is called the registry office so there is a bit of a there is a bit of a of a difficulties that, that, that lie ahead in, in terms of that and you we're talking about challenges so i i think it's important to mention that certainly um 
And certainly we have a one point, I think it's one, 1, 200,000 Venezuelans who are actually in the country, uh, 600,000 of them which are supposed to be regular in the country, uh, 72,000 have uh, visas, uh, I have the numbers here, 87,000 are within the time frame, they, 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 they went into the country with a passport and they're within the, those 90 days where they can actually remain in the country without being uh, irregular, and then 535,000 uh, roughly, or a little bit more actually, that have the PEP. The PEP has been a, has been a document that started, uh, started to be implemented, I think, in 2017, in, in October 2017. It was a, there was a first round that it was made uh, under a resolution or a decree by, by the Colombian government, 6,800,000 people uh, had this, uh, were granted this permission. Uh, it was uh, originally for nine months with the possibility of extension for over two years. Uh, this time frame is going to be expired within August, within October, I'm sorry, this, this, this year. So we will, we will have to see what challenges will, will lie ahead in terms of, of, of how the government is going to deal with this people that are, which permit is going to expire. Then we had a second round in February of 2018, and then the third round was on, on August uh, until December of 2018. This third round was particular because we made first a registration process. We were able to register in different registration points, uh, 442,000, a little bit over 442,000 uh, irregular migrants within the country. Uh, and these people then, with the number that they were given from the <coughs> registration process, they were uh, uh, granted uh, uh, this special permit. Uh, the special permit was granted, I think, to roughly almost 300,000 people. So it is believed that uh, out of the 442,000 people, more than 142,000 uh, actually left the country and they went and moved into Ecuador or Peru or Chile or other countries uh, within the region or did not actually because of the, I don't know the, the time expired or something, they didn't do it in, in due time. So uh, they, they will still be remaining irregular within the country. Uh, and now in December, they implemented a couple of measures. One of them is the PEP four. It's a, it's a fourth round of PEPs. So far, 119,000 people have actually uh, claimed for this uh, document. Um, it's, it will be valid, the session of this PEP, until April of, ne of, of this year. So we're going to see how many people actually are granted within this permit. And there's a second uh, permit that was uh, uh, given to walking migrants and people that were actually crossing or seeking to, to go, like transit migrants, seeking to go to another country. Uh, it's, uh, it's called PIP Tete, which is like a special permit for transit. It's only valid for for a few days within the country, and you are able to just freely transit uh, uh, with this document in, in, into the other border with uh, Rumichaca and Nariño, the southern border, to, to then cross Ecuador, which creates a lot of difficulties because I, I think the solidarity principle itself, without the collective action of countries, is not going to work. So if Colombia decides to implement a new measure for migrants to come from, from its border in, in, in the east to the southern western uh, border to cross to Ecuador. But there is no dialogue between those two countries and then Ecuador decides to shut down the border. This is going to create some sort of like, uh, they're, they're going to pile up uh, the, the migrants within the borders. And this is going to create like a humanitarian distress for, for the different municipalities, even for, for the international cooperation that is, that is seeking to help the migrants, NGOs, international NGOs, NG, local NGOs as well. Uh, the, the regional platform, of course, that is co-led by UNHCR and IOM together to respond to this uh, humanitarian situation, of course, as well. So I think the, there is an important uh, step that has to be taken forward uh, uh, in terms of the solidarity principle has to be uh, mixed together, of course, with collective action and within the countries. And just to quickly finish, uh, just want to mention some of the challenges that we have in terms of migration. We have a peace deal, of course, that is being implemented right now. Although we don't have a, a history of migration, we do have a history, as you mentioned uh, earlier, Andrew, of 7 million displaced uh, population. Some of these people are actually coming back uh, to their territories, and there's, there's going to be a tension right now in terms of 
uh, of resources is. Who is going to get the resources? Is it the Venezuelan migrant that is coming into the country, or is it us? Uh, and this can create some sort of tensions, and I think uh, the Colombian government has to be very, very smart about how to deal with this situation in terms of a territorial-based approach. Uh, there is certainly ELN uh, guerrillas, which are, we're in the middle of a <coughs> negotiation, apparently negotiation, in terms of what, what's going to happen there, but this is certainly uh, difficult, especially because some of them are actually within the border crossing points where, where Venezuelan migrants are coming in. Um, um, there's, we're going to have local elections uh, in October this year, and the idea is to try to reduce the sense of xenophobia within the local e elections, and this is going to be difficult. Uh, I think international communities and NGOs and other countries itself should help uh, the governments and the local governments to try to like create some sort of like elections without the sense of xenophobia itself. I think it's very important to, to have this. Another important thing that we've discovered uh, last year is the fact that uh, roughly when we asked uh, a migrant family how many people are moving with you, it's usually the, the, the average usually goes from 1.7 to 1.9 persons per family. And then we asked them, did you leave anybody behind? And 90% of the people said yes. Are you expecting them to, to, to reunify? And almost... 90% of the people actually said yes. So the population could double. Uh, we now have 1,200,000, uh, and the population could double by the end of 2019. So this is going to be difficult for, for the governments, for the local governments, in terms of provision of services, health, education, labor, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, not much, uh, of course, to mention as well that uh, reunification processes, if they are done within a solidarity principle, but not in terms of collective action can lead to uh, crimes like human trafficking or, or other sorts of crimes that, are, that we have actually seen because people will, will try to move and they will ask other agents, if not the, the <coughs> officials of, of governments, to be able to move to, to other parts of the country. So I think this is important. And definitely, I, I, I totally agree with a little bit with, uh, with what Miriam uh, uh, mentioned a little bit in terms of Cartagena, I think uh, because of the different things that are that have been happening over the past uh, couple of weeks in with, with with Venezuela, I think we could probably shift in terms of having a migration crisis. We, when we asked migrants in Colombia, why why did you come here? Most of them would mention economic reasons. Uh, I think we could see a little bit of a shift in terms of not just economic reasons but other sorts of reasons that can create some sort of like refugee crisis as well. Uh, and this will also have to deal, I mean, Colombia will, help, will, will also have to deal as well as other countries in the region with, with this type of uh, movement as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as you can see, this is a massive undertaking. We actually have Doris Meisner here who's overseen the U.S. immigration system, uh, senior fellow and the head of our U.S. policy program, Kathleen <coughs> Newland, who has advised a number of governments, co-founder of MPI and senior fellow. So you know how massive an undertaking this is. We're talking about you know, half a million or more people. Um, at, uh, soliciting uh, legalization. I mean, this is a massive undertaking, particularly without the history and the structure and the institutional base. Um, are there better ways of doing this, Francisco? I mean, you've really been looking at the ground up. You've been meeting with civil society organizations, convening civil society organizations, and you've also been on the ground yourself. I mean, we've talked a lot about you've been at the border um, and as well as the communities where people are settling in Latin America. So tell us how, how yeah. this looks. Thank you, Andrew, and um, thank you very much, everybody, for for being here, and yeah, there are, there are better ways to do things, and let me just explain where I come from and where my, <clears throat> my views come from. I work for the Center for Justice and International Law, which is a human rights organization, and we basically work with human rights victims. We protect victims, we represent them before international tribunals, the Inter-American Commission, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, and we have uh, worked on many issues on migration here in the U.S. One of the cases that we litigated uh, created standards for the, the prohibition of separation of families. You know how important this is today in this context. In the Dominican Republic, we worked with the prohibition of separation of also family children and uh, the prohibition of massive deport deportations. 
We have done that throughout the last uh, almost 30 years. In the case of uh, how to respond to the Venezuelan crisis, uh, Sejil uh, last year coordinated a group of more than 60 civil society organizations, including refugee organizations like the Jesuits, uh, including human rights organizations in each country, uh, in the Americas, and also from Venezuela. So we started having these debates on how uh, the region was responding to this crisis. And the perspective that we decided to take was uh, the protection of, of rights. So uh, with this perspective on mind, you can see everything that we have talked about um, in two ways. Even the, the glass is full or the, the glass is half empty. So uh, let me just be clear what the report that we are discussing today presents are the innovations that governments in Latin America uh, created in order to respond to these massive flows. But those innovations were in some cases taken very speedily. Uh, they didn't measure the consequences or they didn't coordinate uh, how these measures were going to be integrated with the labor market, with the health uh, services, and with other uh, agreements around the region. Uh, just to give you an example, in the case of Peru, everybody was really happy when the, perma uh, the temporal permit of protection was granted. But, but one of the problems was that the permit was temporal. So it only gave one year and then an extension of another year, but people didn't know what's going to happen. And as Diego mentioned, the 2019 is going to be a year where many of these measures will be tested because some of the, of the procedures will come to an end and we will have to see if people are comfortable with these measures, if they want to renew it. Um, in the case of of Chile, uh, Chile decided to create this visa of resp uh, democratic responsibility. The name is very flamboyant. It, it's like, wow, it's very democratic. It's very responsible, the visa. But actually, uh, some universities in Chile are finding out that this procedure created more danger for people because this visa had to be requested in the consulate of Chile in Venezuela. So first of all, you were telling your government that you wanted to go away. Uh, there were some requirements. You have to present a valid passport and also the criminal record. So according to the research that the University uh, Diego Portales of Chile is doing, this contributed, contributed to the uh, exponential increase of the black market of passports. So these measures have to be very carefully drafted and also consider the, the impact that they have. And in the case of Colombia, one of the studies that we were doing on the ground in, in November was the, the lack of granting of nationality of children born of foreign parents. The problem had not been, or this has not been a real problem because there were solutions for ad hoc cases, but there were no solutions for massive birth of children in Colombia. So by November, uh, we were already documenting around 15,000 children born in Colombia that couldn't access the nationality of their parents, in this case, Venezuela, because of the lack of documents, they couldn't come back to their country. And in the case of Colombia, because the PEP expressly excludes the right to acquire a nationality. So here you have a system that gives you a residence, but does not give you some of the rights that are accompanied with that residence. And, and there was also a debate about if the if the uh, permanent or the, the the PEP in Colombia grants the intention to reside in Colombia, which is a requirement for to to access to to resi permanent residency later on in the process. So these are some gaps that we should consider and, and the report that MPI and the OES put together, they shed some light on these issues. So we have to monitor and that's what civil society is going to do in the future. 
uh, we are going to monitor the implementation of these legal pathways and also identify if there are some human rights violations, lack of access to justice, lack of access to education, lack of access to work or health services. But very briefly, I, I would like to, to mention another of our biggest concerns. Uh, and this is, and Betilde and Diego mentioned it in their presentations, the right to seek asylum, the right to seek protection if you are fleeing your country for any fear valid under the refugee conventions or the Cartagena Declaration. And, and this is a very complex situation because uh, the Americas, if you ask me if the Americas was prepared to resolve this crisis, I would tell you yes. Like one year ago, I would have told you yes, because the Americas has been drafting documents, issuing declarations, modifying their legislations for the last 35 years. So 2018 proved us that there is still a lot of work to do. Colombian officials told us we were not prepared to receive refugees. We always created refugees. We expelled more than 500,000 or 500 or maybe 1.5 million people throughout the, the conflict. But they, uh, so when people came to Colombia and they wanted to ask for refugee, there were no procedures, there were no offices. Just to give you an idea, in Peru, as Andrew mentioned, one of these, one of the outcomes of this crisis was that governments had to respond. They have to digitalize their processes. They have to register people. It was not, I, we were in the border of Peru in September, 2018 nine, ten months after the crisis had already been declared. And in the in the border of Tumbes, they only had two scanners for passports. So people were really happy because they were receiving one more. So <laughs> it, just in that month, September and uh, October, at least 14,000 people must have crossed that border. Uh, in Peru also, the the temporal permit uh, is not coordinated with the local re legislation, so people cannot access to, to the social services. That is one of, of, of the big concerns. And the response that the Peruvian government gave in order to deal with the problems that uh, of lack of identity, identity documents, either cedulas or passports, was to, to establish a, a speedy procedure for asylum uh, asylum claims. But that procedure, I have the picture in my phone, is a piece of paper where you state your name and you say, you answer the question, why are you seeking asylum? So one of our concerns was when these pieces of papers have to be challenged before a court or before a panel, that has to decide if there is a valid claim for a refugee, uh, that would be a, a real problem. So uh, in conclusion, what I was just mentioning, the, this crisis presented a great opportunity to expand on the legal pathways. The governments have decided to take that route, but this was also an opportunity to fortify, to strengthen the asylum claims procedure. And that is not happening, and actually that is going backwards. Governments are giving more more privilege to to other alternatives, which they give a solution, but in the long term, uh, do not contribute to the international framework. And I will leave it there. And and if there is a question, I can expand on on any of the comments that I have made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. and I, I would echo what Francisco says. It's a concern of ours in the report as well that that asylum systems are not really being used. The one exception has been Mexico, but Mexico is, is used, but that's actually starting to break down as well now um, because there are so many Central Americans, Ariel knows, applying for asylum as well, but it was working for a while um, because there were fewer people, right? I mean, it was a smaller number, 
but countries like Colombia and Peru and Ecuador have simply stopped trying to to really use the asylum system as a mechanism um, of yeah. recognizing people's refugee status. We are going to go to 520. I'm doing chair's privilege here, extending our session by exactly five minutes. And that means we have 10 minutes for questions and answers. We'll take a lightning round. We have a couple questions that have come in. Um, if you see me looking at this, it's not that I'm you know, seeing what's going on at home. I'm checking questions that are coming in. So I'll take a couple of those, but also want to open it up to folks here. Um, anyone that wants to tweet us questions at Migration Policy, you can use the hashtag MPI I discuss, or you can send us an email at events at migrationpolicy.org, or you can just raise your hand if you're here. So raise your hand. Joy Olson, great to see you. Great to have you here. Um, Longtime director of WOLA and as well as many other, <clears throat> many other things. Thank you. Um, my question is more on the political side of things. I mean, considering that there's already a um, sort of a move toward authoritarian, authoritarianism uh, in many countries and seeing what's going on in our own country and how, um, and how uh, the impact of migration, uh, in particular uh, kind of uncontrolled migration flows has on that political dynamic. How are, how are people thinking within the region about how, what the impact of this is gonna be in the short and longer term? Yeah. Um, there is a hand here in the middle. Kathleen, is that you? And then a hand here, too. Thank you, Kathleen Newland, Migration Policy Institute. Uh, in a lot of large-scale refugee flows, people come initially with assets, which they then spin down and fall into greater need. I'm assuming with the level of inflation and the economic chaos in, in Venezuela that that is not the case, that Venezuelans are not coming with assets. But am I wrong? <laughs> right here. Hi, thank you very much for this very insightful information. Uh, I'm just curious, Mexico just signed uh, the regional agreement, the MERP, uh, with the North Triangle countries aligned with the Compact for Migration. I am curious if there is talks or any kind of um, indication that the countries involved in the Venezuelan crisis are uh, considering the implementation of an agreement similar to uh, MERPs. Great. Um, over here, gentlemen. Hi, thank you very much. I would uh, second um, her thanks for all your research and then also your insights. My name is Ryan Vance. Like I'm from Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, and one question I had, at least um, regarding a couple of a couple of uh, speakers, noted how asylum claims are being submitted both on paper in sort of a paper form, then also digitized. I was wondering, what is the what are the data implications, at least in terms of trying to track individuals through these uh, not very robust asylum processes, and what challenges are that are those situations, at least on the data side, going to impact um, for states to be able to not only track but then also adjudicate asylum claims once individuals are either within the country or once they've applied. Thank you. And we have one more hand there. Thank you. My name is Natalia Devandi from University of Buenos Aires. I have several questions, but I, I will do one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. I am thinking why this answer to the crisis of Venezuela um, the answer for the countries is different for, from the answer that several countries do, for example, for another nationalities as Haitians, uh, and if this kind of measures could improve the answers for other nationalities in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that is one of the big questions. Any other burning questions here? I, I will, okay, let me t let us take two from that came over the wire. One from C Steve Zanheiser. Uh, Steve, good to have you here with us, at least uh, virtually, um, which is uh, what, what has generated the humanitarian response? It goes a little bit with this last question, but in a slightly different sense. What has generated this humanitarian response in Latin America, which is different than we've seen in other parts of the world, and what is needed to sustain it? Um, and a question from Maura, which was the, uh, uh, about the Cartagena Declaration and whether, since it wasn't binding, whether uh, th there was a way of developing some sort of binding agreement within the context of the OAS or another body. So with this, let us go to our, our panel. And Bipile, we'll start with you. Yeah. 
We've got about six minutes, so that means Very briefly. you have two minutes each. And so. I'll take actually yeah. uh, maybe three of the ones that were posted, and maybe my colleagues can complement, and, and of course all of you. Uh, on the question on the characterization of Venezuelans that you were asking, um, we tend to talk about waves of Venezuelan migration. Uh, and while earlier waves of, uh, of Venezuelan migration uh, included people with professional degrees, even people who left the, the uh, oil uh, company, PDVSA, uh, the, the latter uh, wave, 2017, 2018, and what's, uh, you know, the current flows, include people uh, in very uh, vulnerable socioeconomic uh, um, status and with uh, uh, patrimony that's been exhausted and that, that have to had to sell their cars or sell any property uh, they have at a very cheap cost to be able to, to leave the country. And that's the reason why uh, Diego was mentioning the phenomenon of the caminantes venezolanos, the, the Venezuelan walkers, that don't have the means to be able to purchase a, a, an airplane ticket to get to Chile where their friends or family are, but have no choice uh, than to walk from Cúcuta all the way down to Chile. I have personally known people uh, who have done this. Uh, so unfortunately, this is what uh, characterized the last wave of Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Um, on the question, a uh, very interesting question on the uh, applicability of the MIRPS, of the Comprehensive Refugee Framework uh, that accompanies the Global Pact on Refugees. We are, as uh, OAS, we are actually technical secretariat with uh, UNHCR on the MIRPS uh, process for the Central American countries. And indeed, there are discussions on uh, perhaps considering that framework of cooperation for the South American countries uh, that are receiving the highest flows of, of Venezuelans. I understand this is something that uh, perhaps may be discussed at the next Quito meeting that will happen in the next couple of months uh, of this year. And then it will you know, probably need to uh, find a structure and, and a, a specific mechanism uh, that could be useful for the South American countries. So uh, it's my understanding that it is uh, co being considered as an option for cooperation. And then the final question that came from our Twitter friends uh, on the Cartagena Declaration. I, again, believe this is an important discussion that has to happen at the regional level. The Cartagena Declaration is an innovation coming from the region that expands the definition of refugees, but is non-binding. Non and it's only 14 countries, I believe, mm -hmm. that uh, from the region that have approved it. And, uh, I personally think the OES provides the, the ideal forum to have this conversation, to have this discussion. And if there is a consensus on uh, addressing the need for a binding document, it would also be the OES, I believe, the ideal space to do it. We have a tradition of accompanying these uh, negotiations by the member states on agreeing on, on concrete conventions, inter-American conventions. Uh, so perhaps this is something, and I believe some countries are interested in perhaps uh, at some point getting to this, which will not only benefit uh, um, uh, the finding of solutions for Venezuelans, but will also apply for uh, Central American uh, displaced people and, you know, may be uh, needed for future uh, crisis of displacement in the region. Mm -hmm. Good point out. My colleague Kathleen worked a great deal actually on the Global Compact. So mm -hmm. that was a lot of these issues. Diego, two minutes or less. Okay, uh, you all just basically mentioned a little bit of the plan de acción de Quito, the Quito action plan. Uh, basically, this plan is threefold, and it's a little bit to answer uh, your, your question. Uh, first is how do we regularize migrants? How do we how do we share information? A little bit in terms of your question also. Um, how do we share information? How do we regularize migrants? I think the World Bank right now. I mean, I, I am doing a consultancy right now for the World Bank and. Uh, we're trying to answer a little bit of that question. How do we integrate information? Uh, do we do it by biometric units? Do we use the iris? Do we use fingerprints? Uh, and how do we integrate that information so that if somebody enters Cúcuta, in, in, enters into the Colombian territory in Cúcuta, somebody in Buenos Aires already knows that that person might be coming. Uh, we're trying to integrate systems in, in terms of that for registration. And certainly, registration can lead to regularization and Regularization also can lead to the provision of services such as health, education, labor, etc. So I think this is one of the first uh, approaches. It was it was made in 
I think it was in September or November, sorry, last, last year. Uh, the second part of the, of the Quito Action Plan is a little bit of how the, um, how the other countries are going to respond to the, Venezuelan, uh, uh, to the Venezuelan crisis. And I think this is a political stand from, from the Grupo de Lima. Uh, and I think it's important to, 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 note, to notice this. Uh, they just created like the framework that we're going to have to deal with this situation. And in terms of that, some of some, I mean, we've seen in the, in the past couple of weeks uh, things that have actually happened in terms of of the political stance in terms of how to deal with the Venezuelan situation. Um, we were just having a discussion with the official migration in, in Colombia, and he's now publicly saying the dictatorship of Nicolás Maduro. So I think the, the, the narrative is beginning to change uh, specifically, I think. And, and probably this could lead to, to some sort of like stand politically. And this can obviously impact migration. And as I said before, like it can impact migration not just because we're asking migrants, why is your main reason for coming here economically? But also, we can see you start seeing that political, effect, the political effects of this, uh, of this group can probably even alter uh, the, the the type of migration that we're actually seeing. I mean, uh, this this is certainly something that, that that can happen. And then the other part of the of the of the agreement uh, is um, or or the plan de acción de Quito is. Um, is to deal with uh, how how do we involve the international community? How do we involve the World Bank? How do we involve involve the Inter-American Development Bank? How do we involve the UN agencies? We uh, because I was part of the UN uh, of the system uh, and I was uh, I was in the group that co-led the the, the the regional platform. The, well, I was I was in the in the Colombian part, of course. Um, there is a there is a regional platform right now co-led by the U, by UNHCR and IOM, which has a lot of agencies, UN agencies, NGOs, international NGOs as well, and they try to respond uh, to through an action plan, uh, which has protection, uh, assistance for provision of non-food items or food or uh, other assistance for, for for migrants as well, as well as integration of uh, of those migrants into the economy. Um, so I think these efforts have to be strengthened. Uh, I think uh, at a regional level, as you as you mentioned, Betilde, it's uh, it's important to try to like strengthen this uh, this these efforts and also bring together the World Bank and the World Bank has done. Uh, I think for 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 at least Colombia, the World Bank did a did a report for for the impact of migration within the within the within the country, and I think it's one of the most robust documents that the Colombian government actually has right now, and it's making a lot of its decisions in terms of policy making uh, because of that report. So I think it's important to try to bring together uh, other other areas. Uh, OAS, of course, is going to be very, very important, I think, in w over the over the next few years in terms of, uh, of, of dealing with this cooperation, inter international cooperation for, for, for dealing with the situation itself. Francisco, you're the last thing standing between people's ability to walk out into 20 yeah. degree weather and enjoy the uh, the beautiful day. Just very, very quickly, in two minutes, about the Cartagena Declaration, as as Betilde mentioned, 14 states have already incorporated the definition of Cartagena into their legislations. So uh, civil society will try to to push the judiciary in those countries and the administrative authorities to to implement this declaration, the stakes are very high. Because as Andrew mentioned, only Mexico was applying this uh, concept, but now with the new administration, we don't even know if that is going to change. And why is different this response from other nationalities? Because uh, the, the numbers, the, the velocity in which this process crisis has de developed, but one of the calls that we have been doing from civil society is that we do not, we cannot neglect other nationalities. There are big flows of migration from Nicaragua, which can share the same analysis that we are doing with Venezuela for uh, international protection. The, when I was in Ecuador, some of the people, the Venezuelan people living in Ecuador, told me, we don't want to be in the same shoes our Haitians were in 2014. What happened after the earthquake, 80,000 Haitians went to Ecuador. But four years later, Ecuador decided with these uh, uh, legal solutions that they, that they started that 
they didn't want them, want them anymore, so they had to, to flee Ecuador. And they, they, were, they went to Brazil and Chile. And today, we are looking at that discussion. Haitians in Chile are having a very hard time. Mm. They are being sent back. So people in Ecuador, Venezuelans told, told us, we don't want to be in the same shoes. We are worried that those restrictive measures are going to be imposed. That was in November. Two months later, we are seeing that the, because of this xenophobic uh, discourse that flame that fired up last week, now the Ecuadorian government is uh, putting more requisites. So we have to learn from the lessons uh, from past uh, crises, and we also have to include other groups. There are Asian groups in the Americas, there are African groups in the Americas, so we have to integrate them all, and that's one of the calls that we have been doing. And finally, uh, Joy, about the, your question, uh, about the more the political side, how are people thinking about the short and long term? It is a very difficult scenario, even with the group of Lima and the group of Quito, which encompass the same members, they have to divide because they cannot agree to discuss the same issues at the same table. So the group of, 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 Quito, of Lima is meeting next week in Canada, and the group of Quito just decided a plan of action that Quito was the first one to break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the political scenario, well, first you have to decide which president you are talking to. So in, in terms of the migration crisis, I think that this is getting, uh, things are getting very mixed with the political discussions. And I, I don't see a long-term strategy. I see a short-term strategy, strategy, but not a, a, a short-term strategy. And the last point, I just forgot it, but I think I cover all the questions. Good. Um, there's a lot more we could discuss here. I want to thank um, the Tinker Foundation, by the way, which made our work in, in this possible. Um, Feline Freire, who actually read through the report along with Diego. Um, and made helpful comments that greatly improved it. I commend it to you. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. This is an issue that is not going away. It's only going to continue. Um, it, it is an issue that affects millions of people's lives. It's an issue that affects the entire region and, and obviously affects the United States as well. And I want to thank our panelists for a great conversation um, and the report authors, and thank all of you for being here. So.